morning. Good morning. Good and morning. Happy Sabbath and welcome to our study today. And it's, it's a, an exciting study and it's a deep study and it's about faith. This is a topic we could talk about probably throughout the, e <laughs> the, the lesson, the evening, the night. Um, it's, it's a huge part of our lives, our faith in Christ. So before we get started, Mary, would you pray for us? Our Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for this Sabbath day and for this opportunity to come to you to study your word. And we invite your Holy Spirit to please come into each and every one of our minds and our hearts and help us to learn what you would have us learn about you and your character and your great love for us, and especially about faith and how you want us to grow in faith, Lord. Thank you for answering our prayer, for being here with us, for we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So our memory text come from, comes from Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. So, Christ is our example of what faith should be. He was able to endure. He was able to um, deal with shame. He was able to deal with everything that happened here on this earth, um, being despised. Um, but that faith, that faith in him, is what um, will um, get us across the finish line. When self is renounced, the Lord, and I'm reading from Desire of Ages, page 280, when self is renounced, then the Lord can make man a new creature. New bottles can contain new wine. The love of Christ will animate the believer with new life. In him who looks unto the author and finisher of our faith, of our character, our faith, the character of Christ, will be manifested. So, as we think about this, part of faith is renouncing self, and then Christ can work in us. We have to get we have to get out of our own way for our faith to grow and for Christ to be able to manifest His character in us. So, we're going to spend most of our time in Hebrews 11 and 12 today. And these are called the faith chapters. Um, they describe the Christian life, that race which we all participate in, and in which all who, all who stay faithful will receive a reward. In Hebrews 11, we're going to look at many of the heroes of faith, but Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us a definition of what faith is. Faith is is the substance of things hoped for in the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to say that again. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So it is believing the promises that Jesus left us. Even though we didn't see him on this earth, that faith that he did those things is the the very definition of what faith is. In this week's lesson, we'll go deeper into the lives of great biblical characters of great faith and how they lived their faith, how they trusted God no matter the circumstances that were laid before them. And some of them were circumstances that, that didn't even make sense to them at the time. Hebrews 11 explains that faith is confidence in God's promises even if we cannot see their fulfillment yet. This lesson will explore what faith is and how it is obtained through the examples of past and especially centrally through the example of Jesus. Okay, that's Hebrews 11. Now Hebrews 12 teaches us how to maintain our principles of growing up in Christ. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore we also, since we were surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run the race that is set before us. So this, this faith is a daily work. I, I call it, I, I think it's more of a marathon than a race, actually, because I, I see a race as can be very short, but a marathon is a very long race. And in that, it is daily work. Um, at times we can feel like we can conquer anything in this race. And then there's going to be other times where we feel like we can hardly put one foot in front of the other. And that, that's very common in, in, in dealing with faith. But faith comes by what? Hearing the word of God, doesn't it? And so that is what we need to remember to do is cling to Christ no matter what we think the outcome is going to be. The story of faith doesn't just involve these great men and women of Christ, but in, it involves us as well. We are the concluding act. The drama culminates with our entering and running the last part of the race. And with Jesus seated at the goal line at the right hand of God, he provided inspiration as well as the ultimate example of how the race is run. He is the ultimate witness um, that the reward is true, and he is a forerunner who opens the way for us. If we look at Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. And that's beautiful because Christ is our hope. And he's the one who anchors our soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So we see that Christ now, as our high priest, not only is the author of our faith, but he is the one who is also saving us through faith. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which is, he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. I want to repeat that. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And I just want to make a comment about this wavering thing. That's easier said than done. But yet, that's the hope that we hold on to that without wavering, we hold on to the faith that Christ is faithful. Isn't that amazing? So I want to read to you the faith I live by as I finish up this lesson, uh, this day's uh, lesson. The competitors of the ancient games, after they had submitted to self-denial and rigid discipline, were not even sure of the victory. So if you look at these athletes, they train day in and day out. They work on their, they have special diets. They have sleep regimens. They have exercise regimens. And they push themselves and push themselves and push themselves. So, and in the end, they don't know if they're going to win or not. But yet, they go through and they do that. Such is not the case in the Christian warfare not one who complies with the conditions will be disappointed at the end of the race. Not one who is earnest and persevering will fail of success. The race is not the swift, not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. The weakest saint, as well as the strongest, may wear the crown of immortal glory. All may win who through power and divine grace bring their lives into conformity with the will of Christ. Amen. 
So let's get into some of our greats here in faith. And Greg, or no, Mary, you're going to talk about the righteous will live by faith. Thank you very much, Barbara. Yes, and this is, as you had mentioned earlier, it's a very deep topic, and it's extremely important to understand. So let's dive right into it. Hebrews 10, verses 35 to 39. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So what is God telling us in these words spoken by Peter? Well, first, in verse 35, he says, don't throw away your confidence. And that word confidence is a free, um, fearless, and undoubting confidence because it has a great reward. And in verse 36, he says, you need endurance, and that's a patient, steadfast waiting for. And why do you need endurance? The verse continues, so that you'll do the will of God. And after you've done that, you may receive the promise. Now what's the promise? For this answer, Paul paraphrases Habakkuk, an Old Testament prophet. The promise is in verse 37. You'll see it starts with quotation marks. He's quoting that in a short time, in other words, there's a waiting period, he who is coming will come. Who is he mentioned here? He is referring to Jesus. And this coming is his second coming. He won't linger or delay. And during this waiting period, verse 38 says, the just, and that, that word is righteous, virtuous, those keeping the commandments of God, they are to live by faith. And what is faith? Barbara mentioned it earlier in Hebrews 11.1. 1. It's defined as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I learned something new about this word substance. It's actually in Greek is a compound word. It's made up of two words. The first word is sub, which means low or under like subterranean, submer submarine, and stance, which means standing. So the compound of those two words is under standing. It's translated into modern English, this verse could read, faith is our understanding of things hoped for. And Sister White says this about faith. It is an ascent of the understanding to God's words, which binds the heart in willing consecration and service to God. So we're to live by understanding the promises in God's word that brings us hope. So Paul continues in verse 38, if anyone withdraws oneself, and that word is cowers or shrinks from God, God has no pleasure in that person. But then he encourages the believers by saying, but we're not of those who withdraw and shrink away from God to perdition. But instead, we're of those who believe to salvation. So Paul touch, touches on a number of themes. He touches on confidence, reward, endurance, will of God, God's promise of Jesus' second coming, living by faith, not withdrawing from God, and believing to salvation. So I'd like to focus for a moment on the need for endurance, for patience. This is a characteristic of God's end-time people, and it's essential in order to receive the promises. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know Revelation 13.10 
states, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. But to endure, the believer needs to hold fast their faith. Barbara read this verse earlier, but it's an important verse. I'm going to reread it again. It's Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he, God, is faithful that promised. Now the wilderness generation, we've been reading and studying a lot about them. Um, they weren't able to receive the promise of entering Canaan because they lacked faith. We modern-day Christians are at the threshold of the fulfillment of the promises, right? We're getting ready to enter heavenly Canaan. And we're in that yet a little while waiting period. And we need endurance and patience, which can only come if we have faith. As I studied this week's lesson, the Holy Spirit impressed upon me that faith is the key component to all the themes we touched upon today. So in conclusion, I'd like to end with a few quotes from Ellen White on faith. The first says, what is faith? It is simply taking God at his word. It is believing that God will do just as he promised. The second quotation says, the just shall live by faith. You gave yourself to God to be his holy, to serve and obey him, and you took Christ as your savior. You could not yourself atone for your sins or change your heart, but having given yourself to God, you believe that he, for Christ's sake, did all of this for you. By faith you became Christ's, and by faith, you are to grow up in him by giving and taking. You are to give all, your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements. And you must take all from Christ, the fullness of all blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper. And the last quotation says, Now the just shall live by faith. We must look to Jesus, study his words, pray for his spirit. We should be more frequently alone with God in meditation and prayer. Let us pray more and talk less. We cannot trust to our own wisdom, our own experience, our own knowledge of the truth. We must be daily learners looking to our heavenly teacher for instruction. And then, without regard to ease, pleasure, or convenience, we must go forward knowing that he is faithful who has called. And with that, let's hand it on over to Greg. He's going to continue. You're going to talk Thank about you. Abraham. Yes, I am. One of the greats. One of the greats. One of the pillars. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath to you. And Monday's lesson is titled, By Faith Abraham, dot, dot, dot. So it's By Faith Abraham. So let's begin, again, by going to our Bibles and opening up the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to summarize verses basically 1 through 13, and the reason being is we have limited time for, our, for the lessons that we're leading out with, and so I'm going to summarize them, and then I'm going to come back to verse 17 and 19, because that has specifically to do with Abraham. So let's first take a look at uh, verses 1 through 13, and verse 1 says, again, and we've heard this read twice now, but three times I think is, um, there's a purpose for that. It's to really cement it in our minds. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And then Paul continues to write, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain 
By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And then here in verse number six, it's like God inspired Paul to insert this because he wants to caution us because he's going to give a list of a number of people who by faith acted on, um, uh, well, acted in faith on behalf of God. And he says in verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then verse 7 continues, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And then by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. And then by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age. She was quite elderly. Because she judged him, God, faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him, as good as dead, meaning Abraham, he was quite, uh, quite, a, quite a bit far in age were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, these all died in faith, except for Enoch, of course, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So what did these men of God, these men of faith, do that exemplified their faith, their hope of things not seen? What did they do? They responded with action by a faith that was built from a close, personal relationship with God. They were able to exercise their faith in God because they trusted God. And if we think about it, trusting in God, and for that matter, even trusting in anybody else, but especially trusting in God, we can only establish that by having a close, personal relationship with him. So how do we obtain that kind of faith and that kind of faith that is built on trust? Well, Barbara had mentioned this at the onset. By knowing him, by walking with him daily, reading his word, and talking with him in prayer, and through our personal experiences with him, by walking with God daily, our trust in him grows, enabling us to step out and exercise our faith in him and the things that he asks of us. And I'd like to read a quote from Sister White, which I thought was, um, was very good. And that is, faith is not only to look forward to the things unseen, it is to be confirmed by looking at past experiences, at tangible results, the verification of God's word. Pray, Lord, increase my faith. Faith quickens the senses to work diligently to produce results. Faith elevates and ennobles the powers of the soul, enabling it to lay hold upon the unseen. And she states a little further down the page, he desires his people, even in the darkest shadow, to trust in him. I want to go back to verse 17 through 19, because this is real important. We're going to pick it up from here. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received in him a figurative sense. So as we look at Abraham being asked to give up Isaac as a sacrifice, to us today it seems to be a tremendous exercising of faith. How easy would it be for you or for me to exer exercise our faith in responding to a request like that? But there's obviously a deeper lesson to be learned for all of us. These men of faith and women of faith, by their love, their faith and trust in God, they put God first in their lives. 
And we read just in Hebrews 11.6 that it is without faith, it is impossible to please him. And then also if you look at Matthew 10.37, Matthew 10.37 says, He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So none of us would be able to do any of the things that these people of faith were able to do, especially in Abraham's case. To answer a call from God to offer up your son, your only begotten son, if you didn't have that close personal relationship based on trusting God in the first place. You, we would not be able to do that. We could see the progression of how God led Abraham, of course, and Abraham exercised his faith because, again, he trusted God. God doesn't normally ask us, and I say normally, he doesn't normally ask us to respond to extreme acts of faith unless we walk with him daily and we have that close relationship. What he does is he builds our trust in him, and in turn, our faith in him grows as well. And we know from Scripture that at times our faith is tested. Just as the Israelites, their faith was tested many, many times. And so, too, our faith is tested as well. And it's tested in ways that we may not expect or understand, but we step out in faith because we know him and we trust him. And each of these aforementioned men of faith and women of faith in the passages we just read, it really exemplifies what Scripture teaches us about faith and hope in God. None of us could do what these men did without that close personal relationship, but that close personal relationship is built daily by trusting in God, reading his word, talking with him in prayer. And at the end of the passage in Hebrews, Paul concludes that Abraham resolved this unusual request from God by reflecting back on his walk in faith with God, his prior experience with God, and establish his trust in God. As hard as it may be for us to comprehend and step out in faith to this type of sacrificial request from God to Abraham, Abraham exercised his faith once again because he was able, who tr he was able to trust God through his walk with him. And he concluded that God would just simply raise Isaac from the dead. Why do you suppose Abraham concluded this? I would say, could, could it perhaps be that Abraham, by his faith in God, knowing that God had promised him that through his seed, the, the Redeemer of the world will come through him, and that God would somehow keep his promise, even if that meant that God would resurrect Isaac from the dead? So as we know today, this request from God to Abraham was a test of Abraham's faith in God. And it foreshadowed God, the Father, giving his only begotten son, Jesus, to the world to save us, to save you and me, to save each of us. So the question we should be asking ourselves in concluding this lesson is not only asking ourselves, but asking God, how strong is my faith? Do I have the daily walk that personal relationship with God built on trust that would enable me to step out in faith the way the patriarchs of faith did in years past? I think we should include this in our prayers daily. Ask the Lord, how is our faith? How can we strengthen our faith in you? So with that said, that concludes Monday's lesson, and I'll hand it back to Barbara. Okay, we're going to jump from Abraham to Moses. And our lesson starts by reading Hebrews 11:20 20 through 28. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. And then by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because he saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction 
with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So if we look at this, he even did more. He walked through the Red Sea and he took the children of Israel all the way to the Promised Land. So this Moses had a tremendous amount of faith. And the life, we look at the, the, the life um, of Moses is introduced and concluded in two major actions of defiance to the king. First of all, his parents hid him. And, and then we remember he was hid in the bulrushes and they actually nursed him from a child. And I always wonder, the Bible doesn't say, really say anything about it, but I have, I have a, a strong feeling that his parents had a lot to do with his fundamental faith. And so we want to remember when we teach faith to our children that they know to whom they belong. And Moses left Egypt not being afraid of the king. So the most significant action of Moses was, however, that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This, the reference to Moses' adoptive mother as Pharaoh's daughter suggests that he was slated to be the next Pharaoh. Moses, however, was willing to leave behind the prospect of becoming the ruler of the most powerful nation at that time to become instead a leader of newly freed slaves, ref, refugees, actually. And we have to remember part of that time, he was spent, was it 40 years in the wilderness? Where God was teaching him and training him and growing him up, and he was spending time with God, and he was building that faith. So all who occupied the throne of, of pharaohs um, must become members of a priestly caste. So these, these pharaohs weren't just pharaoh kings, they were also gods. And Moses, as the heir apparent, was to be initiated into one of the mysteries of the national religion. But while he was an ardent and untiring student, he could not be induced to participate in the worship of gods. He was threatened with the loss of the crown and warned that he would be disowned by princes should he persist in his adherence to his Hebrew faith. But he was unshaken in his determination to render homage and none to save one but God, one of God. So that's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 245, if you want to go back and, and, and go deeper into this um, strength that Moses had, that faith that he had to turn away from being king to being uh, a leader of God's people. Or, well, actually the king of Egypt to being the leader of God's people. So if we look at, um, we also want to look at um, Hebrews 10, 32 through 35. But recall the former days in which after you have illuminated, you endured the struggle with sufferings partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which is a great reward. So Paul here too is talking about... Um, um, the struggles and the trials he went through, um, but yet hanging on with joy and compassion. So, that the, so like Moses and like Abraham, the decisions they made were not always an easy path, but yet they chose to trust in God and, to, and go down that path anyway. The greatness of Moses was that he was able to see beyond the promises of the king of Egypt and toward the unseen, namely the promises of God. Hebrew says the key was that Moses 
sight was fixed on the reward, not on the riches of Egypt. So this promised land that God had, had given um, the, the children of Israel in Egypt, they believed would happen. And so that was their goal, was to take their people and go to the promised land. This is the same reward mentioned in Hebrews 10.35, which God has promised to all who believe him. Paul's words about Moses' decision must have echoed powerfully in the hearts of, the, of his original readers. They had been enduring reproaches and insults because of their faith in Christ. They had been afflicted and lost their possessions. So we see, we, we've seen that. I, the, the early Christians, no matter even if it was to the death of the lions, they did not give up their faith in Christ. Some were in prison. We remember that. In parallel sense, Moses chose to be mistreated with God's people exchanging the wealth of Egypt for bearing insults associated with Christ because he believed that the reward of Christ was greater than whatever Egypt could offer. And I want to read to you um, testimonies to the church um, on, on this with Moses. All who will return from the pleasures of earth and with Moses choose rather to suffer affliction with God's people to, rather than to enjoy pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than treasures of the world, will, with the faithful Moses, received an unfading crown of immortality and a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory. So it, it's... We're, we're looking for the same thing that the children of Israel were looking for when Moses was there. We're looking for the promised land. And so it means turning away from the pleasures of this world. The work of salvation is not child's play. To be taken hold of it will let alone at pleasure. It is, a steady, it is the steady purpose, the untiring effort that will gain the victory at last. It is he who endured to the end that shall be saved. It is they who patiently continue in all doing that shall have eternal life and an immortal reward. And all who are engaged in this warfare with Satan and his law host have a close work before them. They must not be as impressed, impressible as wax that the fire can melt into any form. They must endure the hardness as faithful soldiers stand at their post and be true every time. Mary. Well, as we continue along. Rahab. Yes. It's amazing because Paul is, has just finished telling us about Moses and you're thinking that he's going to move on into, by faith, Joshua moved them to Canaan. But no, he mentions this person, Rahab. And who is Rahab? Well, her story is recorded in Joshua chapter 2. She was a woman who lived in Jericho, in the wall of the city. And when Joshua sent two men to spy out the city, she hid them on her roof. She lied to the king and sent his men on a wild goose chase, searching for the spies outside of the city. She then declared to the spies that she believed in their God, and that God would give Jericho and Canaan into their hands. She asked that since she had shown kindness to them by hiding them, that they show kindness to her and her family by sparing their lives when they attack. The spies agreed, and she later helped them escape the city by letting them out her window. When the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, the Israelites kept their word and rescued her and her family that were within her home at the time. The Bible record continues to show that she later married Salmon and gave birth to Boaz. 
And we might remember Boaz. He's the one who redeemed Naomi. Rahab was Ruth's mother-in-law. And she was King David's great-grandmother. She also formed part of the lineage from which Jesus was born. And now she's included in the long list of faithfuls in this chapter 11. Paul writes about her in Hebrews 11, 30 and 31. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So Rahab is, only, is one of only two women mentioned in this chapter. She's the tenth person listed in which each person is regarded as being faith champions. She was a Gentile, and she was a harlot, a prostitute. Isn't it wonderful that she's included in this list? Someone that you wouldn't think of being in the faith chapter. Her inclusion speaks hope to every one of us who have histories marred by ugliness. And what is the action Rahab is noted for? Hiding the spies and lying to keep them hidden? Why would this be noteworthy to be in the hall of faith? She put her life on the line. She was willing to sacrifice to protect others based on what she had heard about God. And in Joshua chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, she says, this is when she tells the two spies when they're hiding up on her roof, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She had a thread of hope and faith in God and acted upon it. She knew very little about God's character and principles. Her faith was childlike, but she chose to align herself with God, and her faith resulted in actions that were meaningful. Rahab's deed of faith was that she heard, believed, and obeyed. She didn't see the plagues of Egypt or the deliverance at the Red Sea, the water flowing from the rock, the manna from heaven, but she believed. Hebrews 11.11 11 says, She said, For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. She was a good exemplar for the Hebrews that was the audience that Paul was writing to because they had not heard Jesus preach. They hadn't seen him perform miracles. And she's an exemplar for us as well because we didn't personally hear Jesus speak or see him perform miracles. In verses 35 to 38, Paul continues listing hardships many of these faithful people faced. In verse 35, he states, not accepting deliverance. This implies that they had the possibility to escape, but chose not to, because their sights were set on God. All these faithful people didn't receive the promise, but they stayed faithful. I'd like to conclude with some encouraging words from the pen of inspiration. By faith, these men and women walked with God, reaching greater and still greater heights of faith. And the word comes sounding down along the line to our time that God was not ashamed to be called their God because they honored him by their faith, 
justifying their work, their faith by their works. Till the end of time, their example of steadfast integrity is to be an encouragement to those who follow the Lord. May the Lord help us to be faithful like all of these people in this chapter of faith. Thank you. Now, Greg, you get the most important person of faith. <laughs> yes, I, I feel honored, blessed, and unworthy at the same time. Good. And what you had said earlier, Barbara, is so true. We could spend all day, all night talking about faith. There are so many layers yes. to faith. And Thursday's lesson is titled, Jesus, the Author and Finisher of Our Faith. And in some uh, different Bible versions, you'll hear or you'll see it say, perfecter of our faith. So let's begin by opening our Bibles and begin to read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has cast, I'm sorry, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So let's take a little closer look at this verse, or at these verses. So what are these verses actually asking us to do? There's really four things. To lay aside every weight and sin. To run the race with patience. I love what you mentioned, Barbara, that this race isn't a speedy race. It's more like a marathon kind of race because it's a day-to-day -day walk as we discussed here. And to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and to consider him, to think of him, and that he endured such contradiction and hostility from sinners against him, the creator of the world, our creator. And so if we don't keep our eyes set on Jesus, if we don't think about Jesus we may become weary and discouraged in our souls as well. So what does Paul mean when he says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith? Well, the word author in the Greek is archegos, and archegos is an adjective meaning chief leader, prince, Christ, and in the Greek lexicon, I found this interesting too, it also defines this adjective as one in who the preeminence of his faith far surpassed the examples of faith commemorated in Hebrews 11. So Jesus is that one. Jesus is the chief leader, the prince, the Christ, and that only by him through the power of the Holy Spirit, he makes faith possible for us. And think about this. Jesus is our example. He lived the example for us, who perfectly embodied what a life of faith was all about. And Jesus is the reason that we have faith. As one with God, he expressed, he demonstrated, and he lived the faithfulness in God the Father and in God's faithfulness to us. So our faith is a response to our trust, our faith in his faithfulness. And the word finisher or perfecter in the Greek is the word teleotes. And teleotes means, believe it or not, finisher or perfecter. So the definition is actually the name that is, that is actually given or the word that is actually given. And one who has in his own person raised faith to its perfection and so set before us the highest example of faith. Let me read that again because the, the definition that they're giving along with finisher or perfecter, one who has in his own person raised faith to its perfection and to set before us the highest example of faith. The Greek lexicon also states that this word occurs 
nowhere else in the Bible. And being who I am when I look into the statements like this, I want to trust but verify. And you could trust me, or you could trust God's word, or you could trust the Greek lexicon, but check for yourself. Nowhere else in scripture is that word used. We looked it up, and there's only one time. So who is that one that this description was talking about? It's Jesus. He is the only one who has finished the race in its fullest sense. He is the only one who, perf who perfectly exemplifies how the race of faith is run and that only Jesus can faith reach its perfect expression, only through Jesus. It was Jesus' perfect life that made it possible for others like you and me to run this race. If Jesus had not come and lived his life as an example for us, running the race for everyone, for each one of us, it would have been futile. So how did Jesus run the race of faith? Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8 tells us, Let this mind be in you which also which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death at the cross." So Jesus never sinned. He kept his eyes upon God the Father. And to fulfill his role in their plan of salvation, in their plan of redemption and restoration, to redeem us, to redeem you and me. Why? Why did Jesus do this? Why did God do this? Again, we look at John 3.16. That's a verse that we quote oftentimes in our Sabbath school lessons. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever shall believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why God did it. That's why Jesus did it. It is only by faith in Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us that this faith can be perfected and completed and finished. So now it's our turn to run the race of faith. Though we in our own strength, we can never achieve what Jesus had done. But by faith in him and through him, and by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us, we can. Jesus has paved a way for us, and he's marked the path to take us all along the way by his own footsteps. And through Jesus, we can move forward in faith, trusting in his promises and his example. It's our choice to do so or not. And just in closing, I'd just like to read two very brief excerpts from our sister White regarding this important subject. And first is Signs of the Times, June 15th, 1891. It is through the grace of Christ that we are to become overcomers. Through the merits of his blood, we are to be of that number whose names will not be blotted out of the book of life. Everything that blots and stains the soul must be removed, must be cleansed. Where? From our hearts. From our hearts. That's what Jesus is looking for. And then in early writings, page 113, give up your self-confidence and self-sufficiency, brethren. Boy, does that speak to me. Does that speak to you? Does it speak to each of us here? to give up our self-confidence, our self-sufficiency. Aren't we supposed to do that in this world today? But no, we're supposed to look unto Jesus. So she continues this and said, and follow the meek pattern. The pattern is Jesus. Ever keep Jesus in your mind that he is your example. And you must tread in his footsteps. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And thank God for that. I, I was so heart-touched with, with that lesson. It was like, how do I take all this information and boil it down? Lord, help me. And I hope that you got, at, got out of it as much as I did. But I, I really like that lesson. So I'll hand it back to you, Barbara. Thank you. Amen. Mary, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to share? I would just like to encourage all of us 
as Paul said here, to hold on to our confidence, to remember that we're going to have to wait a little while until Jesus comes a second time, but he's going to fulfill that promise, and that we need to live by faith, to understand those promises, and as Rahab did, even if we don't understand them fully, to whatever extent we're able to, let them have an impact in our lives, that they will lead us to meaningful actions in which we're going to honor and glorify God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Um, the final thoughts that I have actually come, in part, comes from Friday's lesson. But I think it's important for us to um, think about this, this marathon of, of faith and how we hang on to it. And I feel like Steps to Christ, pages 69 and 70, are the key to, to how to hang on. Because there's days where, we're gonna we, where we will have the faith of giants, and then there's days that we think we have the, the faith of a child. Well, the faith of a child is actually better than the faith we have most days. But, where are it, but in child, I mean weakness. Because children's faith's pretty good. But, but there's times that I feel like I have no faith at all. And, and I don't think that I'm the only one that goes through this. I think we all go through that. So let's, let's read Step to Christ 69 and 70. By faith you became Christ. So that's how, you, that's how we all got here. We came in faith. And by faith we are to grow up in him. By giving and taking, you, give, you are to give all, your heart, your will, your service. I want to say that again. We're to give our all, our heart, our will, and our service. Give yourself to him to obey his requirements, and you must take all. Christ, the fullness of his blessings, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. So this giving and taking is... Is, is really important piece of, of hanging on to our faith. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O God, as holy thine. I will lay my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into God's hand, and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. Amen. Amen. And that is how we, we strengthen our faith trusting day by day, following him day by day, doing his work day by day. And as you do that, you learn more and more to trust in who he is. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this lesson of faith. Father, we're so thankful that you are the author and perfecter. We're thankful, Father, that you are the ultimate sacrifice, that we can trust in that. And Lord, we're thankful that you are preparing a home for us in heaven. That you're up there working with us day to day. That you're growing us, our characters, to be more and more like you. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiving us. Thank you that we can lean on you when we feel we have nowhere else to turn. And Father, as we look at these great men of faith and women of faith, we see, Lord, that it, it, it may not always be easy, but that the reward is worth it. If we continue on in this marathon, our hope will be eternal life with you. So thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Happy everybody. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.